Hi there, my name is Jennifer Adams and I'm the Editor-in-Chief for the Knowledge Hook Signature Leadership Series and welcome to all of you. It is uh, a great pleasure to have you here for our webinar, our roundtable today. Uh, we are here with the SEL Global Leadership Series and this is uh, the three partners up, up uh, at the top of the screen got together and decided that at this time with pandemics going on and, and lots of challenges in the world that an SEL Global Leadership Series was the right thing to do. So welcome. The Knowledge Hook Leadership Series is uh, one of three partners that got together to do this uh, work together. And uh, Knowledge Hook is a digital math company from Canada, and they are very dedicated to providing thought leadership in the areas of Education 2030, Future Skills, and Improving Math Achievement. And we'll have an opportunity to talk a little bit more about that as we go through. The second partner is Salzburg Global Seminar, and it's a not-for-profit that uh, came into being in 1947, just after the war. And uh, they do incredible work. They're a think tank that looks at policy from uh, a number of different sectors, including education and finance and health and climate change. And they have fellows from 180 different countries around the world. So they're the second partner. And the third partner that's taking place, uh, that's helping out with this is Karanga. And Karanga is a brand new organization. It's the Global Alliance for Social Emotional Learning and Life Skills. And uh, they have uh, 85 different uh, steering committee members from uh, organizations around the world. There's a real intent uh, with the organization to make sure that they're we're welcoming uh, work in social emotional learning from different regions in the world and in different languages. And uh, myself, I'm a proud uh, executive committee member. So those three groups have got together. And uh, who do we have with us today? We have uh, registrants from four Canadian provinces, from 12 US states, and from 15 countries. And uh, we have a really big group from Newfoundland in Canada today. So welcome to them and to all of you. It's my pleasure to uh, introduce to you the host and a, a fellow um, Karanga Executive Committee member. Uh, Joanne McKechn, who's been doing uh, wonderful work for many years uh, as part of her company, The Learner First. Uh, Jojo is a founding member of New Pedagogies for Deep Learning, and lots of you have a connection to that. And uh, she is, uh, was working out of Seattle, Washington, and has now relocated back to her homeland of New Zealand. So Jojo, welcome, and I'm going to hand it over to you to introduce us to uh, what we're going to be talking about today, and to Kim and Michael, who will be joining us. Kia koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, ko Jura Mekekanaho, ko Ngaitahu te iwi, ko Aotearoa te Whanonatanga. It's such an absolute pleasure to be here today and as Jen said, I'm, I'm speaking to you from my home country of Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, what I just introduced was into my home language of uh, um, Māori and um, that's really important to me to speak in my own culture and to speak in my own language and to really recognise our identity, language and culture. And I think that's one of the things when we talk about assessment is how can we actually do that in our own identity, language and culture. So I think that's what we'll talk a little bit about today is around equity. It's my pleasure to really introduce you to our next two panellists, um, Kim and Michael. They're both really important people in the world around assessment and they've done some great work with us. So Kim is um, the Professor of Faculties of Education Medicine at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver. And Michael is the Senior Vice President of Education and Testing Services at Princeton in New Jersey. So I'll speak a little bit more about them as we go through the day. Um, and as we go through the session. But first of all, I'd just like to talk a little bit about what does assessment and SEL mean for me? Um, when I first started working in this space, I really started to recognize that if we really do value humanity, we really do have to start changing how we assess. My um, director of, of the Learner First in Australia, she recently wrote a blog titled, um, uh, it was titled uh, um, Leading in the Dark or Writing uh, Assessment in the Dark. And it's really based on sort of looking at if we drive a car, and we just have the headlights on, we're really missing the whole vision and the view of the rest of the world. And a lot of the times when we're doing assessment, we just are looking straight ahead and we're not seeing the whole person. And sometimes with assessment, that's how we've been looking at it. We've just been looking at one or two aspects of the person. We're not taking into account the whole person. So when we think about SEL and assessment, that's one of the things that we really have to take account into. 
In 2015, I wrote a book titled Making the Important Measurable and Not the Measurable Important. And I really started to focus on how do we actually see the whole learner? What are all the pieces of a learner that really, really count? And how do we understand who each learner is? And so for me, unless we change how we assess, we can't change any system. To me, it's the lid of the assessment, the vault of the assessment system. It's what we need to do because what we focus on is what we actually do. So I'm really excited today to really be able to talk through sort some four questions that are really important around assessment. So if we move to have a look at what those four questions are, how can we effectively assess social and emotional learning to really enable equity? And for me, equity is around, can children show what they know in the way that they choose to, not in the way that we as adults want them to show us? Second question is around, are there different ways of measuring social and emotional skills? Do we only have to do it in one way? And then really that sort of looks at who decides and who determines in question three, what the success criteria actually is going to be. And who decides that is the whole system? Is it a community? Is it the family? Is it the students themselves? And who has the right to make those decisions now? These are really good questions to really be pondering on. And then the fourth question is, what can senior education leaders do to encourage the assessment of that broader set of skills in their schools and classrooms? So how do we do this? If the focus has been on traditional academic skills for many years, what are we going to do to really broaden that set of assessment? And how do we do it in a manageable way to make sure that we can do that? So it's my pleasure to actually ask Kim to start us off today. Um, she's um, from the, the Professor at the Faculties of Medicine, University of British Columbia, as I've said. She's an applied developmental psychologist, a professor in the human development learning and culture area in the Department of Educational Counseling, Psychology and Special Education in the Faculty of Education, University of British Columbia. She's been a teacher and has spent many years examining multiple programs and she's an expert advisor. She's on multiple boards, and so we're really excited to have you here today, Kim, and we really look forward to having, hearing your stories and sharing your knowledge with the rest of this team. Thank you so much, Kim. Over to you. Thank you so much, Jojo. This is such a pleasure to be here with everyone. And as in these strange times, it's weird to be sitting in my office just talking to my computer with some images, you know, other people on the screen. So um, I do uh, just, uh, you know, it's so hard to see people's expressions. So anyways, I'm hoping that you take away some important information, at least one thing from this. Um, and I also, and I really appreciated Jojo that you acknowledge, you know, acknowledging in your own language, um, from New Zealand and I, I often traditional, um, as people know, in Canada, we begin often by recognizing, acknowledging the territory in which we are presenting. So today I'd like to acknowledge that I am presenting today on the unceded traditional territory of the Musk Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh nations. Um, we are, we are uh, able to live, work and play and learn. Um, so just really acknowledging that. I put information about my contact information that people can see if they have further questions um, beyond this. Um, uh, one of the things to really keep in mind is in terms of social emotional learning is the assessment um, approaches. Oh, it's just going ahead. It has its own uh, mind here. Um, is this idea that you have to have meaningful, measurable, and malleable, that these skills can be acknowledged. Um, we know now CASEL, the Collaborative for Academic, Social, and Emotional Learning, has provided some important guides as we reopen schools. One is this, um, the power of social and emotional learning, and another one um, just released is, um, is another guide for reopening schools. And they really give four, um, four sort of identify four things to really recognize. And I'm just going to really highlight the last one, which is use data as an opportunity to, to deepen relationships and continuously improve support for students, families, and staff. So I want to sort of double click on this notion of how looking at assessment of SEL, particularly now um, as we are concerned about the well-being and social emotional uh, competence and health of all um, both students and adults is so critical. Um, in one um, recent report uh, that was done of uh, print of principals, 800 principals actually, they really found that uh, the report indicated that you know 99%. This is in the U.S. believe that social emotional skills are teachable in the school setting. 95% report they were committed to developing students' social emotional skills in school, but only 37% reported that they were familiar with current assessments that are available for measuring social emotional skills, and only 31% that said they believe that 
the teachers know, knew how to use data. So I, I really want to say, you know, having taught in teacher preparation for so many years, worked in schools for so many years, that, you know, we, we get so much in our training is how to assess those curriculum uh, skills, but not very much on how you assess these other skills. And, and in fact, I still believe a lot of people b believe out there that they're not, um, they're not a, a, a able to assess that. So I wanted to really um, talk about that. Um, but CASEL, who had an assessment work group, um, have, has created a guide called the SEL Assessment Guide, where you can go, if you go to measuringsel.com, you will be able to find um, different ways and be able to search through different measures by grade level um, as well. Uh, Kira just shows you there's an assessment catalog. You go and sign in, you put in the grade level, you turn to talk about which, you know, mention, um, write in what you want to assess and you'll be able to get all the different assessment tools. They've done an amazing job. So I really want to highlight for you that there is this now guide and others uh, there's Rand Corporation also has an assessment guide. There's a number of assessment tools that have really emerged in the past few years. And I'm not going to go through all of those. I'm really going to give you sort of a snapshot of what we're doing here in British Columbia. So in, in British Columbia, Canada, um, as well as other jurisdictions in Canada, we're really using data as, an a, as a catalyst for action. So sometimes we think of data as continuous improvement that kind of comes after the fact. And really what I've seen is we're using data as the spark to ignite the conversation about SEL. Um, just to give you an idea that um, in 2016, British Columbia had a redesigned curriculum, K-12, to and uh, included a competency-focused model that was really on these core competencies of thinking, communication, and personal social competency which is SEL, which focuses on pers positive personal and cultural identity, personal awareness and responsibility, and social responsibility. So now this is integrated in our K-12 system. So um, on the one hand, it means that teachers now have the, and educators can focus on that. And I have to say it's a huge focus as we head back to reopening schools. But they also have to look at how do you assess it? Now it's part of the curriculum. So what are we going to do about it? So at the Human Early Learning Partnership, where I'm a professor, which is in the School of Population of Public Health, we have a vision of all children thriving in healthy societies. And over the past 20 years, we've developed tools to assess children's well-being and social emotional competence um, across development. So from the TDI is the toddler development instrument that parents complete, the check is the childhood experiences questionnaire that parents complete when children enter kindergarten, the early development instrument, hit, which is been around for 20 years. It's used all across Canada and other jurisdictions, which is a teacher report measure of child readiness for school. And then the middle years development instrument, which is a child self-report measure, which I'm going to talk a little bit about, take a few minutes. And then the youth development instrument, which is um, for uh, grade uh, 10 or 15 year olds, which is right now being piloted. And, and just so you know, what we do um, at HELP is we're, because we collect students' personal education numbers, we're able to connect and do a child monitoring system to follow children across development, as well as link to their education outcome data and a number of other um, outcomes as well. And um, I really want to, I love this metaphor. I wish I knew who said it. So if someone knows, tell me. Um, using data as a flashlight and not as a hammer. This has been our real mode of going forward to saying this is about how we we look at the data with curiosity um, and we don't look at it as a way to, uh, to <laughs> hammer down people to, to try and follow a certain guideline. Um, the MDI, which I'm going to talk about, I'm the principal investigator of it, and it's a self-report measure of child well-being. It's strengths-based and linked to um, health and well-being of children and social emotional development inside and outside of school. It has five dimensions that include social emotional development or SEL, physical health and well-being, connectedness um, to adults and peers, school experiences, and the use of after school time. We have an index of thriving, so we're able to assess children on this. Uh, we created a composite, so you look at percentage of children who are higher or uh, medium or low in terms of their well-being. And we also have an assets index. And this was a really important thing. So we learned from children about the assets in their lives, the adult relationships, nutrition and sleep, peer relationships, and after school activities. Um, and we're able to see where children have these. And the reason these assets are so important because they're actionable. They're things that you can do something about. 
We also have aligned it closely. If some of you are familiar with CASEL, I'm guessing you are in the CASEL framework of the five competencies, we've actually uh, aligned it perfectly with the five dimensions of SEL as uh, uh, spoused by CASEL. Um, and then uh, just to give you an idea, we started the MDI in 2009, uh, 2010 across British Columbia. And it's a population-based measure, which means that all children at that grade level, fourth and seventh grade, complete the measure themselves. Um, so it's not just a select number of schools or something, it's the entire school district. And as you see to date, we have data on almost 160 uh, 140,000 students in BC, um, and it's also being used across the world. It's in Australia, actually, and in uh, Germany and Israel, um, as well as the UK um, and other jurisdictions in Canada, and also the US as well. Um, we report back the data to schools because we feel like if it's going to be actionable, it has to have the data reported um, back. Both at in, Every school gets their individual school report on, uh, on their students' data, and then there's also a school district and community report that goes and compares each um, uh, the school with the provincial average. Um, and then we also do GIS mapping. So you're able to do, we do maps of children's well-being and the assets by neighborhood. So you can look at a whole school district I'll show you and able to see um, how the different neighborhoods are doing. And, and it goes back to your first question, Jojo, is this idea of using data for equity is by able to see where children are in this and these maps, you're able to see are there differences in their well-being. So you can ex, um, examine differences in students' social emotional competence competencies across the different dimensions. So each school district, uh, school and school district gets um, how you, you see high, medium, and low on here's just an example of optimism, empathy, and pro-social behavior, and see how, what percentage of children are in the high well-being to medium well-being to low well-being, and how it compares with the district average. Um, or the provincial average for all the children in BC. You can examine students well being in grades four and seven the, at the population level. So we actually present these where you say, you know, in grade four, all participating districts uh, in BC, 42% of the students were thriving for the grade seven, 38%. And what's gonna be very interesting is we have data from children in, in February across the province and we're collecting data again this next February. So we're really gonna be able to look at changes over time. And we're now actually gonna be asking some questions specifically about COVID in our, um, in our uh, measures. So here's just an example of a map. If anyone's been to Vancouver, um, the darker green, darker greens mean a uh, larger percentage of children thriving, lighter is lower. So you can see right with a snapshot by neighborhood of how children are doing, where are the areas of the, of the Vancouver in which there's highest thriving and lowest thriving. Um, and we can monitor children's well-being over time. So here you see, um, for grade seven, we could look at their thriving on the well being component and look at how it has changed from 2015, 2016, all the way to this past year as well. Um, and we can examine the assets as well at the population level and examine these over time. So you see here, um, here's uh, the great uh, all participating districts from 2018, 2019 to 2019, 2020 for the seventh graders. Um, and you can see um, always nutrition and sleep is kind of the lowest uh, level as well. Um, and this just gives you a map again about adult relationships, how many the darker brown means um, uh, more, uh, a larger percentage of kids have positive adult relationships. Think of, we use the brown colors to be like the richness of the soil. The darker the color, the more in nutrients are in that soil to uh, foster thriving and well being. Um, and I just want to end with two examples um, of how we use the data uh, to action. And, you know, this idea of SEL assessment at the population level, using it the universal. So this isn't every child gets their individual score, it's really about addressing all children and getting a larger so that the actions are at the universal level and not just at a targeted level. So, so, um, so here's two examples and, and we do have a field guide that you can go on and see is discover MDI. It's a toolkit. Um, so here's one example. It's very interesting. One school district um, of reducing inequalities in after school time. So um, uh, Burnaby school district, they got a map on their assets for after school time 
of, and basically the asset is how many, what percentage of kids are involved in structured activities during the after school hours. And you see these in different neighborhoods and you see very clearly the darkest, remember my dark soil metaphor, you see the darkest ones where there's a lot of kids who are really involved in the after school activities and the very light brown like the desert, they're not. So here you quickly see there's a lot of inequities happening across the uh, community of Burnaby, the, the city of Burnaby. So they decided to really put an intense effort of connecting a lot of their after school programming with community centers um, because it's about children inside and outside of school and said, can we shift this? So you see then the next year, they, they actually do show changes where they show, again, the darker brown. There's still some inequities though, with one group not having as much, one group having much more. And again, uh, at many people coming together to figure out how do we create opportunities for all students in the after school hours. And I have to say one thing on the MDI is we not only ask kids what they're doing, but what they wish to be doing. Um, and then you see again the next year they're working toward and there's there's more dark. There's not the desert anymore, but there's more dark. Um, and then you see the final year where there's actually no differences across the communities. There's all richness of the soil. They all are participating. So, so the MDI can help show where the inequities are and then lead people to see can we do something and then to be able to monitor that over time to see if those efforts have have shifted this population level of well-being and then finally um, the last story is really about um, a connectedness to adults at school so we asked children a question how many adults at your school are important to you so port alberni a school district in um, in british columbia they found their seventh graders, 34% said two or more, but 53% of their seventh graders said no one across the whole district. So they said, oh my goodness, we have to get to work. So they put in lots of efforts. How do we connect with students? How can we make sure they're seen? Important information for right now. What happens when we put in those efforts? And as you see, they were able to shift it from 51% now having two or more to 38% having none. And again, um, shifting that again. So the data really allow at the universal level. So it's not, again, not targeted. How can we create the, the support, the social emotional competence and well being of all of our students? And uh, that's it. Thank you very much. I look forward to questions. Great, thank you so much, Kim. I have a thousand questions running through my head and I wish I could just have a conversation with you, but there's lots of other people here, so we'll have to take some of their questions. If you have questions um, for Kim, please put them in the chat box. I'll ask uh, for questions and answers at the end, but it's my pleasure in, to, to welcome Michael now. Michael's a great friend of mine. Um, he's uh, also uh, has a great reputation for being a policy researcher and educational assessment and student performance and achievement and in equity. He regularly publishes in the area of public policy, student faculty uh, and access and opportunity. He's also a great dancer and a singer. So if you ever get the opportunity, make sure you take the time to be able to do that with him too. So Michael, thank you very much for joining us today. I know you've got a great session with us and we look forward to hearing from you. Please also, if you have questions for Michael, pop them into the chat box and we look forward to having a question session at the end of this too. Thanks very much, Michael, over to you. Thank you very much, Jojo. Um, I'm delighted to be here uh, this afternoon or morning, depending on where you are. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's a pleasure to have this opportunity to think uh, with uh, the global uh, community about uh, social and emotional learning and development. I want to start with um, um, thinking about how I have um, have uh, imagined and, and thought about social and emotional development historically. In over 40 years of my research, um, I have actually been thinking about student affective development and um, social uh, involvement and co-curricular involvement and development as it relates to their performance and success in various types of institutions, most often in higher education institutions. These are some of the measures that we've um, looked at over time. They wind up being factors uh, that include a variety of measures in one um, in one uh, concept. So academic integration, for example, uh, all of these come from survey research uh, and academic integration may involve several different um, topics. 
related to how students in, interact with the academic aspects of their institution. As students progressing in school, we expect them to become better academically integrated, to have more co-curricular engagement and to be familiar with those aspects of their institutions. Uh, what is important about this is that over time, we have found these to be significant contributors to um, their performance, whether it's grades or test scores and, and uh, achievement, even their motivation to learn. Uh, now, that is the historical perspective. These have become much more focused as dependent measures now. I mean, these are things that we think are important for students to uh, learn and uh, develop in these particular areas, their peer interactions their interactions with uh, teachers and, and faculty, uh, their interactions with in advisors, having mentors and mentoring relationships. Those are not easy to navigate. Uh, and even to set goals and career plans. These become objectives now, not just for purposes of outcome measures like performance on test, performance in school, but in and of themselves, we're recognizing that these are important uh, uh, aspects of student development. At ETS, we uh, continue to explore and develop a variety of measures of social and emotional learning, uh, depending on the, on the context. Some of them are K through 12 contextual, um, you know, game-based assessments for English um, programmatic skills, uh, pragmatic skills, and NAEP in the collaborative problem solving. Uh, thinking about how students collaborate and develop their collaborative skills. I'll come back to that in a bit. Uh, in the higher education area, we, had, uh, we, we looked at how student success is determined by their social and emotional learning, especially in, as it related to their persistence in college. We have a huge uh, persistence challenge in most colleges and universities in the country. About half of the students who enter graduate within six years uh, with a degree. And some of that's related to their, uh, how they navigate the social and emotional development aspects of their environment. In Heighten, I'm going to come back to this one. This is an outcomes measure of higher, of higher education. So most of our activities has been around higher education. I'll come back to Heighten to show you some of the indicators within the Heighten um, instruments. In graduate education, we use something called the Personal Potential Index. Uh, over time, graduate schools have asked us to think about how to measure student involvement and their preparation for graduate school beyond the GRE, beyond quantitative and uh, literacy and, um, and verbal skills. People were interested in how students develop socially and intellectually and their curiosity, their pursuits of their intellectual lives. The challenge with this one was to get a direct measure from students this instrument was actually uh, de developed for faculty to write about their students. So it's, it's, a, it's a complicated uh, set of, of, of uh, assumptions you should have to make uh, about their learning, their actual social and emotional development when it's one off in that way. We are in the midst of a, um, in a society where we are looking for holistic uh, file review and particularly in colleges and universities, and I'll come back to that. And then in the workforce, we had a, a, a go at taking a look at um, how students are prepared, how people are prepared for their performance in the, in the workplace. And, and faculty, uh, teacher professional development as well. So this is a person you might, uh, I, I'm not sure what you would think about this image, uh, whether the person wears his social and emotional learning, or whether you can 
gauge it by simply seeing the person. Look at that smile. He must have a great deal of uh, capability in team work. Uh, he must have, he must be a responsible person. Look at how he's dressed. Um, I, you know, how do you measure these things? Creativity, uh, re responsibility. Um, you know, how do you measure resilience? You can't simply tell by looking, perhaps. But those are important uh, to the workplace these days, and so we are thinking at ETS about how to measure those in, in the best way. Now, the heightened instrument, which is, um, I mentioned earlier, has some interesting uh, measures of social and emotional development. Um, at the bottom, you see quantitative literacy and written communications. Those are two staples of measurement. Uh, but some of these others have been uh, creeping into our expertise, our, our capabilities over time because of the demand by colleges and universities and elementary and secondary schools that we think about them. Civic competency and engagement. Uh, critical thinking. These are very difficult measures to things like um, uh, task-oriented, activity-oriented things to measure. Uh, intercultural competency and diversity. How much do we understand and how much are we able to work with people of different backgrounds? Now, on the, I mentioned earlier that the National Assessment of Educational Progress, which is administered to a sample of people, has become interested in um, is a sample of third, eighth, and twelfth graders, uh, interested in collaborative problem solving because they recognize uh, in, in the national government that these are becoming skills that are demanded in the workplace and they're expecting schools to help students develop them. Uh, you know, these are also difficult to measure, uh, challenging, I should say, to measure. They are possible to measure. We have a kind of a belief at ETS that if it moves, you can measure it very well. Uh, but if it breathes, you can measure it. So uh, these are, uh, but, but these are special kind of skills to measure. Uh, if you're thinking of establishing and maintaining, for example, a shared understanding, how do you measure that? Do you measure it through observation? Do you measure it by having people, uh, you know, monitored and monitor and, and uh, keep track through using artificial intelligence, how they, um, you know, react to, to um, you know, prompts or, or uh, you know, any kind of provo uh, provocation. Uh, taking appropriate actions to solve problems. It, this is group-oriented work. Establishing and maintaining order in a group organization. Um, it could also include how much people participate. You know, very often you have uh, passive participants in group work. And how do you measure people's abilities if that is the case in a particular social context? Uh, perspective taking and social regulation. Now, we are also uh, in uh, facing a period where people, uh, institutions, are going becoming test optional, uh, thinking that the traditional uh, standardized uh, test of literacy and numeracy, math, and science, and, um, and literacy may not be the only important aspects of people's backgrounds, uh, but some other characteristics um, that are obtained through personal statements. You know, what do people choose to write about? What can they tell you about their experiences and how? Uh, what kind of passion do they write that with? Um, those are indicators to people in colleges and universities very often of the types of people they want to work with when uh, they become students. Uh, the, 
the types of students they think they can have the most success with. Uh, letters of recommendation often capture student experiences that the student him or herself may not even think about. And um, their work and research experience also is impo important uh, in the admissions process. And social and emotional indicators might uh, include their creativity, their communication skills, teamwork, resilience, we see that often, uh, ethics and integrity, uh, planning and organization skills. Now, how would these be captured? Personal statements, again, interviews with admissions officers, and this is going to also require us to become better interviewers as well, right? How do we rate people of different backgrounds and experiences, uh, different people of different uh, demographic characteristics? So those are all uh, measures that um, that are emerging to be important. I'm delighted that Karenga has emerged on the scene because it offers us a valuable new resource to think about uh, helping to to teach and uh, and measure these uh, these skills. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Michael. That was very very interesting and informative as well. And I could talk to you forever as, as well. So it's great to have both of you here. We've had a question from the floor, and then I'll uh, add some more questions to it. And please, um, anybody who's in the audience, if you have any questions for both of our experts, please feel free to pop them into the chat box, and we'll make sure that they get answered as well. So the first question I have for you is for both of you is. Do you have any data in real time to initiate corrective preventive actions? It was one from the floor that we had. Um, so, so I would say um, that's so interesting. The real time idea. I, I'm, I'm our data at um, in British Columbia. We don't collect it. It's more at a population level, and then we give reports back right away. Um, I uh, it would be great to find out if there are any there's two things I want to just mention. One is um, the assessments, you know, and, and we didn't talk so much about competence versus perform like uh, performance based measures. And there's some emerging measures. I know Clark McCowan has done the cell web where students go in and they are able to answer different questions and give tasks and, and VSIP, which is now virtual where students in ages nine to 12 go and have create an avatar and then go through these social situations and how they respond. It gives more of that. Um, I, I do, and maybe this, maybe Michael knows about this or anybody else. Um, I had this idea, but I don't know if it's coming to fruition where teachers would have an, uh, there would be an iPad program and they would be able to rate each student's comp SEL competencies and then um, in that day and then push a button and then out would spit like, here's the five things you can integrate in your curriculum for SEL right now, you know, when you're doing social studies or science or things like that. But uh, I don't know if it's come to fruition. Hmm. I'm not aware of anything that's come to fruition like that. Michael, are you? Yeah, well, it, it's interesting that you raise that. I, I can't answer the question, but I think I can tell you that I'm working on trying to answer it. Um, <laughs> We have a, a platform at ATS called the Collaborative Problem Solving Platform that is designed to capture those data. And I've been learning about this over the past couple of weeks because we're working with moving that technology to a platform of territoriums, which is a, a, it's a much, much more uh, business, a, a public facing platform and we're trying to figure out how to capture uh, behaviors. Uh, so uh, stay tuned. I think some part of this um, is using the chat space uh, for people to document observations, even team members who are not actively on the stage at the moment, uh, but also some of it is just being recorded, uh, if, but uh, by, by somebody like a teacher. I'm not sure if it's an iPad or mm -hmm. what the instrument is yet, but people are working on this. So I think uh, it's an important point. One, one, of, the, one of the challenges that, that I think both of you raised when I was listening to was that, um, Kim, you sort of mentioned self-reporting and Michael, you talked about a challenge about getting a direct measure from students. Is self, self uh, is, you know, social and emotional learning is around about yourself. Um, you know, you go to the doctor and they ask you, do you have a headache? And they believe you when you answer. 
are we in the position now where we are, we're able to believe students when they tell us what they believe about themselves? How, is, how do we collect that information? When, when, te when students talk about themselves, do we believe them? Are we able to trust them? How do we collect that information about them? When you talk about self-reporting, when you talk about getting a direct measure from students, how do, you, how do we get to the point where we can trust what they say? Yeah, so I think this is, um, this also is a challenge for, um, for measurement. Um, not that it's, that it's not good at the moment or great at the moment, but, but if you think about regional differences, even within the United States or, re, or uh, geographic differences across the globe, some societies are better at representing themselves than you know individ as individuals mm -hmm. and others are taught to be humble and, and mm -hmm. that's forthcoming about themselves right so mm -hmm. uh, you have to take into account the cultural mm -hmm. uh, aspects and origins of, uh, of people when you're uh, measuring these things so it's, it's a, it becomes not something that we shouldn't try to measure but it becomes a challenge for people who are responsible for the measurement it just okay. it, and, and for developing the tools for measurement. Mm. And I, I just add thank you so much for that. I mean, I can you know teach entire courses just on the whole issue of self-report and validity and reliability and all of that. So I'll just make three points. I think one thing is yes, for some constructs you do have to be somewhat suspicious of self-report because of social desirability. And I think some of those things that Michael mentioned. Um, so certainly things like empathy, like I'm a really empathic person, you know, and sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, that's one thing, but things like depression and anxiety, you really, it's harder to, um, or happiness, you know, those are things that are objective. So I think you have to rely on self-report for some things like I have a headache or, you know, mm -hmm. things like that. Um, mm -hmm. And others more suspect. And, and that's where I really love the idea of going to more of these performance measures that are like this, this VSIP I mentioned where you have an avatar and you're able to um, go through situations because you're it's more closely relying to that. Um, and I will say the other thing is, it, you know, I, I, I feel that it's all about validity and, and um, you know, how valid is that person responding and how, uh, and with the middle years development instrument, which fourth grade and seventh grade, some people are suspect of whether the kids will give the right answer. But what we find is it predicts a number of other outcomes that theoretically are linked. So for example, students who, whose well-being is higher also it predicts um, some of, actually it predicts some of their well-being three years later or, you know, and, or it's related to teacher reports or peer reports and things. So, um, so I think that that's the other point of, if, you know, depends on the construct, but also you really have to have clear uh, indication of, of um, of how accurate, how responsive this, how how accurate the students are in responding. But um, I think sometimes we're suspect that younger students can't report on their own inner states, which is it's not it's not been uh, supported. Um, and then I think the last piece is I always again really feel like we use a confluence of data to really understand something. So we just don't rely on one thing that you know mm -hmm. when you're developing you want to have. How do these things come together? Um, and I think that, you know, so multiple sources of data are really important to begin that. Uh, there's something, you know, all kinds of predictive validity and concurrent mm -hmm. validity, things like that. Yeah. yeah. I think, I think you've both raised some really interesting points and I'm pointing up and down the screen um, around, you know, the multiple mixed method assessment, having plenty of data that supports either, you know, a, a whole range of assessment that you can synthesize together. But I think Michael, you know, your point around the cultural piece is really, really critical because I think different cultures, um, you know, having lived in multiple countries, seeing the difference between how cultural identity comes into play is really, really critical around social and emotional learning. So it's a really very, very important point to consider when we're assessing um, social and emotional learning. I have another question for both of you. Teachers often feel caught between how and what they should assess and what happens on large scale assessment. Assuming large scale assessments begin to include ECL, how will this, will this help classroom assessment? In terms of um, how will it help classroom assessment or yeah. Um, Will this help classroom not, assessment when it comes in? So, so like this, they're sort of caught between this whole idea around, um, you know, like, you know, assuming that, that the large scale assessments begin to include ECL, will this help them be able to assess in the classroom? So like, because at the moment, a lot of assessment in, in large scale is around academic. We don't, you know, there's a lot of systems don't actually include ECL at the moment, but if they start to do that, will that help them 
in the classroom? What, what sort of things would be looking for to include? I mean, I, I'll just start, Michael. I just want to say to me, it's so central to have data literacy, to really think about why the why you're collecting the data, what's an important, what can you use. And I think that's what happens. I, I sort of mentioned this in the beginning that often in teacher preparation or often we focus so much on the academics so teachers feel well equipped to be able to know what to do with that that information around the SEL I don't think it's the same way I mean data in some ways I mean I'm going to go back to what Peter Senge I don't know if you know Peter Senge he does lots of stuff on the five um, of systems thinking is like data are meaningless unless you know we help make meaning of it <laughs> you know you get these numbers and they're meaningless unless you are mm -hmm. able to understand um, and to me, that we have to make really certain that when we start these SEL assessments and we start using them, that we spend so much time helping people understand why we're doing them, why they're important, how we can use them, how they can um, improve, uh, improve education for all. If we don't spend that time ahead of time, we're going to get nowhere and it's just going to be another thing like, oh, another thing we have to do and not uh, other numbers. So I just I just want to stress the importance of spending that time both before and after. And, and you know, using that example from British Columbia, where the data um, showing the well-being of children is actually what sparked the increased attention where there was then more effort in education to spend on that to be able to look at it. So data were the were the instigator, so I call them yeah. instigator rather than the outcome. Right, okay, Thank, thanks, Ken. Michael, do you want to comment on that one? Yeah, I think, um, you know, sometimes I think this is an area where um, the, the cross discipline and the cross um, uh, skill collaboration can be helpful. Um, I, the first place I think of uh, sometimes when I think of SEL is drama and theater departments <laughs> or drama and theater classrooms. Uh, this is where I think people aspire toward um, interaction and performance and much can be observed about people uh, when they're, you know, tested in uh, performing and in group learning. Uh, that could be transferred to math classes, for example, or to English language arts classes. Uh, teachers of those subjects have to bring out the best in students, right? They have to think about impulses that, you know, people have and good days and bad days and how to treat people when they have good days and bad days and uh, what are their, uh, the skills that they're, tr that they need to get the most uh, out of their performance, or the, the best performance in, in the subject area. And so I think there's a lot for teachers to learn um, in, you know, and it depends on the context also. It depends on whether you're working with uh, students who are highly motivated, uh, have a lot of hope about their future versus people who think that, you know, nothing they do will matter. And I think you have to, uh, you know, this is this is part of the difficult task of, of teachers. But again, important to measure, important to observe and do something about. And I was just going to add one more thing, Jojo, is um, oh, so much of what we learned here is how you go back and share the data. Um, so much is about the meaning making and the knowledge translation activities um, and how, how, how you inform it. And what we found has been very effective of, of starting with strengths, of starting presenting the data and identify a few of the strengths. Um, I often involve people in, in actually guessing how they think their students are, you know, so, so really um, being very engaging rather than just uh, here's, here are all the numbers, but starting with the with the strengths and the things where the light and, and it's that you know I'll reiterate my that metaphor of using data as a as a flashlight and not as a hammer and really thinking about what can you shine a light on both some of the strengths and where we need to see growth and then anyways and I think in context matter context 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 because we know um, that matters so much because you could have a student who can report really high empathy in one context and you put them in another classroom and they're not as much you know so that in context is important. Yeah, 
There's been a couple of really big global things that have been going on um, at the moment. One, one, one of them, obviously, is COVID that's happened. That, that's really been affecting the world and, and changing the way we live. And then the other thing is, that's been going on through the United States is obviously the racial tension that's been created. Not created, that's been brewing for many, 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 many years. How do you think that's affecting what's going on right now for social and emotional learning and assessment? How do we think that that's, that's affecting how we're thinking about it? Those two big key things that are going on in the world right now. Michael, do you want to start and I'll jump in? <laughs> Jojo, can you say that again, please? So we've got two big two big global events that are really occurring. One is COVID-19, and then we also have the, the racial understanding that we've, we've got tensions going on because we've got racial tensions between the fact that we have been have had policies that have, have been discriminatory to get towards certain people in our, in our world. How do you think that SEL and assessment can help us in those two areas? Uh, yeah. Um... That's a very difficult, um, uh, you know, question. Again, one that we have to continue to work through. So I'll give you my uh, impression at, at this point. I think that um, uh, earlier I mentioned something called intercultural uh, mm. communications and inter intercultural uh, engagement. And I think that some of the racial issues that you you refer to have have much to do with uh, people's understanding uh, and comprehension about uh, you know different cultures or even within same cultures uh, different people's um, conditions. And so uh, I think what we've observed uh, in the states in the United States over the past several months has crystallized uh, our uh, awareness of the gulf among population groups uh, in you know, how people treat each other, what people's perceptions are about people's capabilities. So we've got a long way to go. And I think uh, we haven't even touched the surface of it. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think it's important to introduce uh, this into our curriculum much, much more than we have in the past. And I think that's why it's one of the measures that we are advocating. I think, mm -hmm. I think Kimberly made, Kim made the point earlier uh, and, and so did Jennifer about the value of, of what we measure being mm -hmm. what is considered to be important. Mm -hmm. So, so that, uh, for the, uh, in, in terms of COVID, um, you know, part of our, our problem is, uh, or our challenge, is that it has forced us into um, realms of existence that we might not have imagined mm -hmm. being in. Um, you know, most of us are sheltering. Today's mm -hmm. meeting uh, is being held virtually. Uh, earlier today, um, we were on a conversation that where we were recognizing the benefits uh, of what COVID is allowing us to do, have several meetings across the globe within an hour of one another. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's forcing us to have different levels of tolerance about how we uh, you know, uh, cope with the world. On the other hand, uh, you know, um, not everybody is fortunate. It, it forced it, you know, it causes us also to realize that sheltering for some people is not sheltering as well for others. Uh, when we're thinking about people learning uh, remotely because they can't go to school and we have to think that some some people for the, for some people that's a step up in their environment mm. from the traditional classroom but others it's a disaster i mean it, it 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 depends so i think it really causes us to and i'm deeply concerned about the inequities uh, associated with um, you know how people learn and mm. uh, develop in covid not just in terms of um, you know academic subjects, mm -hmm. but also the um, 
the social emotional learning that that occurs when people have you know social environments that they are accustomed to that have been constructed yeah. for interaction uh, you know school environments college and university environments so yeah. i think this is really presenting a, a tough challenge for us yeah, and I think with social emotional learning and assessment, we really have to be conscious that the world has changed and we can't continue as is. We really do have to dig into some of the, the, these issues and really think seriously about how are we measuring and assessing social and emotional learning in a different world that, that the world that we're in today. So I think that's some really chewy things that we do have to really discuss and I think have to bring them to the surface. Thanks, thanks, Michael. Tim, do you want to add anything to that? I was just going to add, I'm going to do the glass half full answer. Um, <laughs> the... Um, okay idea that, uh, not that you did the half empty one, Michael, but you know, just to try and think about this idea is it's an opportunity. It's a time to pause and, re and, and reinvent education um, and assessment, because I think there's no time that at least in my history or my lifetime where I've seen such an important time in which to focus as the uh, focus should be on social and emotional learning and well-being and finding out how do we able to capture the well-being? How can we reimagine education, which is in somewhat a, uh, a sort of older system, you know, that was born out of industrialization to pivot and start thinking of assessments in a certain way. And, and you know, and I, I'm just saying, you know, in British Columbia, um, we are, all schools are reopening with the primary focus on um, SEL, resilience, and trauma-informed practices, and, and not just for the students, but for the adults as well. So, um, and finding out how to monitor those, um, I just think it, it, it's, it's an opportunity. And so um, we should really think of how are we able to, um, and, and on the one hand, the, the inequities have been surfaced in a way they've never have been before. And now through so many initiatives like Black Lives Matter and others, we're able to sort of bring together people who maybe before hadn't. So I just I just want to say um, let's let's uh, I'm seeing everybody on here let's take this as an opportunity to reimagine even assessment of SEL in a way that's going to help um, grow uh, healthy thriving citizens of tomorrow. I'd like to thank you both very much for giving us your time today and giving us some really deep deep conversation and giving us some ideas to think about providing us with some tools some evidence some ways of thinking about social and emotional learning and assessment both of you are very experienced in this field you've got many years of practice many years of ideas and knowledge we appreciate the the deep 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 level of experience you have um, for our people who are in the audience it's great that you've given us your time today please contact us if you want any further information from both of these amazing people um, we really appreciate the time and the energy that you've given us. So thank you so much for your time today. We really appreciate both of you. Go with love, go with Arahonui and uh, Kakitiano. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jojo. Thanks, Michael. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jojo. And we're just going to uh, end off with a couple of slides. Uh, I'm going to add to uh, Jojo's comments and include her in this. Uh, we are fortunate to have all three of you that have shared an incredible amount of uh, information around you know, what's out there in SEL. Uh, we're very hopeful that things can look different as far as large scale assessment and, and right down into assessment in the classroom. Uh, just a reminder that um, this information is available. Uh, these, um, this webinar is available on knowledgehook.com slash leadership. And all of the SEL Global Leadership Series webinars are there. They're free for anyone. All you have to do is uh, sign up for it and that uh, you have access to all of those. Uh, in addition, uh, the participants, the registrants for this will be uh, receiving a thank you email and you will have a link to uh, not only the on-demand version of the webinar, but also the presentations, the slides from Kim and Michael. Um, I know I was looking at a couple of them and thinking about different groups that I would like to use some of those slides with. So uh, really appreciate that. Finally, um, what we have is just to uh, let you know that we have another roundtable coming up in a couple of weeks. And uh, this one is back to school and with a question mark because we know around the world, school is looking very different this year. So uh, we have uh, a wonderful one of the co-authors from uh, the Policy Institute out of uh, Stanford. And uh, we also have two school superintendents, uh, John Malloy out of California and an associate director from uh, the Toronto District School Board who will be sharing uh, some of those challenges and what's it, what it looks like. So please join us for that in a couple of weeks. Thanks to everybody and uh, we will see you next time. <laughs>